We're here with Alicia Bay Laurel. Alicia has actually written a book from the inside, living on the earth, about experiences, being, living in communes, in the communal lifestyle. And I feel it's such a wonderful opportunity to have you share with us that experience from the inside. And the, the first thing I'm just dying to ask, because we all think of communes and utopia, the hippie dream and all that. Um, what's the magic there? What's the magic? Did you feel magic when you were there? And what was the source of that? The magic was living with nature. Mm. There was no cement between us and nature. There was no glass between us and the air and the stars. And for me, that was magical. That was, that was a heady potion. We're here with Peter Richardson, who runs the American Studies program at San Francisco State and is an author who has written about various aspects of the 60s, including Grateful Dead, etc. Welcome and thank you for coming down and talking with us. It's my pleasure. So, of course, we're looking for that value that we can find from the culture of the 60s, the movement, the counterculture, etc. Do you see a lasting, resonating impact today in culture and society in general? I really do. I mean, I think that there's two ways to think about it. One is that the Summer of Love is a kind of culmination of things that were happening in the 50s and 60s. And, and then I think the second part of the story is what's happened since then and the, the effects that the Summer of Love has had on not just the region, the city and the region, but also American culture more broadly. And I, I don't really think you can understand the second half of the 20th century American history, that is, without understanding the counterculture. Mm, that impactful, that important. Right, and, I, and I, you know, if you, if, and you can't understand the, the counterculture without understanding what's ha what was happening here in San Francisco during that time. So, so I, I, I do think it's been very important, and I think you can draw a kind of straight line between what was happening in the summer of 1967 and what people are saying now about uh, so-called sometimes disparagingly as so-called uh, San Francisco values. And I think those hinge um, largely on a kind of um, effort during the 1950s and 60s to expand our, our political and our artistic and our sexual freedoms. And I think if I had to sum it up quickly, it, it might focus on those three things. What about our cultural life today would not be if not for the counterculture of the 60s. It's probably almost easier to do the opposite. I, th I think al almost everything changed because of the counterculture. Uh, our sense of well-being, our sense of spirituality, uh, how we get high, how we think about everyday life, how we think about love, how we think about our spiritual practices. I mean, the counterculture had a major inflection point in modern life. I would love for you to elaborate on any or all those. You put an impressive list of things mm -hmm. up on a slide during the presentation. Let's go a little bit deeper. I mean, what about love? I think one of the things that I love is, is a, a book comes out. Everybody should read this book called Groovy Science. And, and these guys really broke it down by case and, and showed us how much of the ways in which we live everyday lives have changed. So when it comes to love, I mean both physical love and the emotional bonds we have with each other. I mean, people in the 1960s in the counterculture really interrogated what kind of loves were there? And how did they mean? And what was the relationship between sexual intimacy and emotional intimacy? And, and people thought about those things publicly. And I think that was the breakthrough that everybody kind of been feeling those things and worrying about those things. But suddenly we were able to talk out loud about them. They brought it to the limelight. They brought it forward to the public conversation. That's right. And the I public think, forum. You know, and some of it was right here in San Francisco. Did you see a lot of love on the communes? Sure. Yeah. And if you have a good compatible group of people, um, which is pretty essential, um, you, you well, it's like a, any relationship. Over time, it can really deepen. If you want it to deepen, it can do it. And a lot of communal relationships do. What's, what's the magic in the commune? The magic? Well, yeah. 
part of it is just fun of uh, being around other like-minded people all the time. I mean, that's pretty nice. Uh, we spend a lot of our time with people we don't know, we don't have much feeling for. Um, and there you're really in an environment of people who think like you do, at least ideally. Uh, you also, there's a real feel that you're going to make a difference. I mean, that, that's kind of the underlying drive, I think. Uh, there are different ways you might make that difference, but today a lot of communities are environmental in nature. They see a planet as just rolling off the edge of the cliff, and this is maybe a way we can attack that. Um, in, inherently, communal living of any kind is a step in that direction because of the efficiencies of communal living itself. If you have, well, Twin Oaks community in Virginia, uh, about 100 people, and I think they have around 12 or 15 cars, that's enough, that's all you need. Um, so instead of having 100 cars, they've got a few. I mean. Where's the environmental gain there? There's a big environmental gain. Um, and this, that just is repeated throughout. You don't need all of this stuff that we have. You don't need the energy consumption that we have. You can live a perfectly satisfactory life on a lower level. And by, in communal living, you do. It's just part of the animal. You, you, you bring up so many points to, and threads to pick up on. I'm, I'm fascinated. I didn't realize that you lived on a kibbutz in Israel for a couple of years. And I I'd did. like to tie that together with the, the hippie commune movement. And, well, and I, concept. I definitely do. And I don't believe I said that formally. But I feel that one of the big differences between the beats and the hippies was the hippies, when you came down to it, those the real hippies were communal. Yeah. They weren't here just to get stoned. Communalists. Yeah, we just to get yesterday. stoned. Communalists. Like, why, I, I, I should, anyway, uh, let me stop for a minute. Yeah, community, because I, and then with the death of the hippie, have you already covered the, the diggers, by the way? We, diggers get brought up uh, all over the place, yes, of course. Okay, well, I was there with Peter Berg and Peter Coyote, uh, Peter, Peter Cohen, who became uh, Peter Coyote. Okay. I think he's around. I don't know if he came to the conference, room, but anyway. Yeah, we haven't seen him around here, but he is around, and we do plan to go up to Sebastopol and talk to him, too. And uh, uh, anyway, Peter Coyote, Peter Berg, and the diggers came out after that song, Come to San Francisco, wear some flowers in your hair. You'll meet some friendly people there. And we realized, well, who's that? I guess that's us. And out of it came the, uh, uh, the uh, long before Food Not Bombs, came the feeding every day, so and every day in the panhandle. Yeah. It was still kind of sexist, women, mostly, mostly women doing the cooking. But it, was, but, but it was a bold move of rebellion to feed people, to nurture people. That's just the, the irony that I love so much, that it took bold rebellion to nurture human life. Yeah, wow. And you can look at, uh, if you wanted to figure, uh, the, a lot of the, the there's diggers, diggers.org, I think, and uh, you'll see that a lot of the digger papers so online, uh, Rather, I forget his name, put it online, because we had the Digger Papers. They were like the Hugh Manifestos. Uh, uh, we said Manifestos, that's the other sexist thing that we're still struggling with. Hugh Manifestos. And, uh, but Digger women were definitely, there wouldn't have been Diggers without the Digger women for sure. Mm, okay. and, and so you had, so when we talk about the posters, when we talk about the shows at the Lavalon and so on, remember there's all people were being, being fed were being fed in the panhandle. Mm. And also you saw, saw the book of the free store. The free store, yeah. The free store, and it started as a garage on, on Page Street called the Free Frame of Reference. <laughs> and somebody, somebody built a, a big picture frame and you step through it to get in. There's that concept of the hippie utopia. Sure. Do, you, do, do you see some utopia out there in the communes? Well, utopia is what you make it if you're really doing what you want in life. I mean. How much better do you get than that? Um, utopia is a funny word in our society. It's thrown around in funny ways, I think. Uh, it means for a lot of people kind of pie in the sky. It's unrealistic. It's a dream maybe, and it's done by silly people who don't get reality. And that to me is not what utopianism is at all. Utopianism to me is imagining something better. It's dreaming, if you will, it's, it's vision and communal living almost inherently is, has that. How about the other side of that San Francisco vibe coin, the ideology here uh, of the values of peace and love, compassion, sharing, diggers, free spirit, communal living, um, how uh, psychedelics, 
yeah. uh, consciousness expansion, etc. How do those ideas seem to go over with the current generation over there? Any affinity for those values? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think particularly uh, this kind of culture of openness like we were talking about before, right? A culture of acceptance, of inclusion, of diversity, right? That's something that, you know, in France, where I am now, where the, most of the especially young people embrace this idea, right? It's, it's, it's older people who are struggling with it. It's not young people, right? Uh, come out of the closet and let us know who you really are so we can accept and embrace and love you anyway. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly, <laughs> right? And, that, the, and uh, you know, thank God for that, you know, that there's young people who are on board with that message because it's the politicians who are so worrying, right? And kind of, cult just as in this country, kind of cultivating this kind of fear but I don't think most young people, at least the ones I encounter at universities, are not falling for it, right? And they can really relate to it uh, in San Francisco or New York, right? Like when, I, when we teach this kind of stuff, it resonates clearly. What are these San Francisco values you're, you're referring to in there? Uh, tolerance. You know, sympathy, good mm. temper, mm. Uh, but mostly these freedoms, you know. And, you know, you can trace it in a number of different ways. You can look at these uh, court decisions that were coming down in San Francisco in the 50s and 60s. I mean, you could look at it culturally, the spread of um, organic food markets, um, recycling centers and other environmental efforts. Um, uh, rock festivals. There really were no rock festivals before the Summer of Love, and and just the the spread of those ideas from this region um, to to the rest of America. It's a, it's sort of our gift in many ways. Not not to say that it was all bright side stuff, but there were a lot of things um, that came out of the Summer of Love and and that period more generally that I think have real value and that are appreciated that way. It's beautiful. And what about all the peace and love thing and the diggers, free spirit, and taking care of each other and free food in the park and living communally? Well, that was really important. And one of the, one of the talks we heard today or yesterday on the Back to the Land movement was really a, a direct outgrowth of, of that. And we're talking about millions of Americans that did it. That was a national movement, but it had a very interesting sort of local chapter. And, uh, and that's worth understanding, too, and the kinds of effects that that has had on our culture and the way people have thought about uh, community, for example. Community is so important here in San Francisco because, um, as I say, you know, it wasn't a very competitive, um, aspirational culture. It was always a matter of people getting together and, and supporting each other. And when they did that, good things happened. And, you know, but sometimes it fell apart or there were real setbacks as well. But the, the, the basic, um, the underlying values, let's say, of the beats and the hippies, I think, can still be seen in, in San Francisco today and still need to be fought for. I mean, you know, that, that's the thing that I mentioned earlier. There are no lasting victories. You're always going back and making sure that, mm. that um, that some of these accomplishments can be sustained. Well, let's make a lasting victory out of it and proclaim ourselves you know, believers that we should take care of each other mm -hmm. and that they were onto something then and that a summer of love can be a, a forever of love. If there's value in their actions and their insights and their practices, let's embrace it. Let's, let's learn from history and, and apply it today. And it seems like a consistent factor in that culture was just that peace and love. We just want peace. We just want to love each other. We, we want things to be better than they are. We want things to be more equitable and more yeah. just than they are. We want to feel we're all brothers and sisters. And how could any of those be a bad thing, really? <laughs> well, I mean, the thing is now, people feel like you're not allowed to yearn for things mm -hmm. sometimes. And here's a moment in history when there's millions, I mean, first hundreds and thousands and then millions of people who really are yearning for the world to be a better place and their and the, and their own individual selves to be healed in a better way and uh, for the society to work better mm -hmm. for on behalf of everyone and you know i think they maybe that history gives us permission mm -hmm. to think about what what are we yearning yeah. for how, so how many of us are yearning for those things now right and wow. then grown exponentially <laughs> yeah and then how do we turn the yearning into action yeah. And effect solutions. and solutions right yeah. and 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 how do we keep asking the questions better that's why i think like 
I don't worry as much about whether the counterculture was a success or failure, because I think what's more important is it's a model for how to keep trying to think harder about things that are dilemmas, right? They're not easy. There aren't easy solutions to these issues. So how do we keep thinking harder and try to ask better questions, I think is part of the project that, that the Summer of Love um, joined. I mean, they joined a history of people doing that before them and that we can uh, participate in that lineage of trying to think harder about the world. I love it. And it's a great punctuation mark, too. How do we think harder and ask better questions? Yeah. Let's keep doing that. Right? Exactly. Right. It's this lyric that I hear in a seven second song, clenched fists, black eyes. And he right. says, we're aiming for a different goal, succeeding where the hippies failed. But one thing sure, and you can bet, will be more than a drugged out threat. They were a straight edge band. In your opinion, and what you've observed, read, and studied, were the hippies just a drugged out threat? No. Uh, <laughs> Good, thanks. <laughs> the hippies were not just a drugged out threat. Yeah. And, I, uh, and that's part of the point of, of the paper I gave yesterday, was to talk about how part of what inspires punks what inspired them as children was the example set by hippies and by that generation. Mm -hmm. And then there was a kind of frustration that's built a little bit on caricature on, of, of the hippies kind of failing, giving up, kind of abandoning the cause. And then punks feeling like, right, we have to revitalize this. We have to restart this. So like one punk I interviewed the other day said, we have to kick the carcass out of the way and then get our thing going, right? But it wasn't like a complete rejection, yeah. right? Of like killing the hippies the way you're often told. Right? It, it sounds like just a, a, an accepting of a baton and running with it. Yeah, exactly. Well, and, but, and, and then a lack of willingness to acknowledge that that's what they were doing. Right, that's the strange thing is the total lack of willingness to acknowledge it because particularly here in San Francisco, there were a lot of people who were originally punks, uh, sorry, originally hippies who become punks, right? So there's, there's all of these punks are kind of baby boomers, right? And they ra range in age kind of dramatically from people born in the 40s to people born in the early 60s. But the ones who were born in the 40s, they're hippies first, right? And then they become some of the most important intellectuals and architects of the early punk scene. So there's a clear through line from the counterculture to punk. It's just not acknowledged by most of them because most of them were so disgusted, they claim right, with, with the failure of hippies and of that generation. Yeah. One thing I always noticed was they talk about marijuana being a gateway drug. And to me, it seemed like it was more a gateway drug because it, it caused you to cross that line into the black market, the underground. The, you're now do something illegal. You're, you're choosing to break the law. And so now you've, you have a kindred spirit there with you when you're both breaking the law. You're both now in that underground. Yeah, that's a really good insight. I, I think especially in the 1960s when maybe not so bad here in Northern California, but in some places to get caught with a very small amount of marijuana could put you into jail for years. And, and so you were living in a place where you had to trust each other, right? Dealer, Snitches and all Dealers like that. had to trust the people were buying from and vice versa. You had to trust each other. If you're going to get high in somebody's house, what did that mean? And it's a great phrase. Abby Hoffman of the 60s said, we're all living in an illegal nation. And that was a boundary point. Were you in that world or not in that world? Were you somebody who would cause someone to get arrested? Or were you someone who'd be, hey, you want to hit? And that was a solidarity that was really profound, in part because of the persecutorial nature of the state. And you, you always knew they weren't a cop if they took a hit. <laughs> That's good. Right. And right. it tests people. <laughs> what about some tangible lessons that we can take, carry forward from that time. We've talked about some of the influence, some of the values, the festival culture, and, and the birth of so many things that we still are flourishing today, of course. Where's the, the, the value there that we can take from that through line and, and use to, to flourish the good side of the ideology, what they were getting at, the openness, mm -hmm. the, the, the nurturing of others and the planet, the ecology, et cetera. Well, there's a lot of different ways um, we, can, we can follow up on that or lessons that we can take away from it. One of them is that you, there are no permanent victories. I mean, you're always sort of working on it, keep trying to move it, move it forward and um, 
I mean, just to, as, as one example, maybe not the best example, but I mean, people were fighting for or fighting against uh, the war on drugs here a long time ago. And, and a, a lot of people have recognized that the war on drugs, which started in 1972, was, was, was always a kind of uphill climb at the bottom that, that, that had pernicious political motives mm. and really is, hasn't done any, very many people very much good. Mm. And people here were fighting that very early on and proposing productive alternatives to it that, you know, it took a long time for those ideas to get any kind of purchase at all, but it does seem to be an area of change that you can point to. It's amazing. I was just thinking, like, there's no winners in a war on drugs, and the drugs themselves probably don't care if we try and kill them. No, no, it doesn't seem like <laughs> It's it. a war on people, and yeah. when we go to war on people, especially innocent people who have chosen to ingest a substance in some way, do we, need we war against them? Your talk did focus largely on LSD and the, the psychedelic experience. What, what value do you think that brought to the table? What, where, how do you think that the, the psychedelic experience impacted the effectiveness of the culture? I think without LSD, there would not have been a counterculture. So, I mean, it's that basic and that important a fact. And it's not that LSD, as we all know, instantly turns someone into a cultural critic and profoundly rejecting of society. I mean, you know, as, as Timothy Leary used to say, uh, set and setting matter, and taking LSD in 1967 is very different than taking it in 2017. Social conditions change, cultural meanings of the drug experience change. But I think in 67, when LSD was new for overwhelming numbers of people, it was this incredible hard kick that really forced people, and I do think that's the right word, I think the drug experience forced people to kind of look around them and say, what's artificial, what's real, what's genuine, what's not? What's a script that my parents laid on me or my priest laid on me or my teacher laid on me? And what is it that I see myself? And LSD, you know, it has utility for that kind of exploration. We just came out of a lecture that highlighted LSD, psychedelics, and their usage and influence on that counterculture. What was the role that, that psychedelics, or even cannabis, played in the black movements, black power, black panthers over there? That's a good question. Now, um, what I did find is that there was a lot of conversation around uh, weed. So you would have even the Panthers rules, uh, you know, rules about not using weed, doing political work, right? There was the sense that that was a leisure activity. That was something that was in fact questionable politically. So they actually had rules that said, you know, you couldn't be high and go out and do work for the people because you were then in a vulnerable state. I think we have to understand the Panthers is a movement that was always under attack. And I think the, the lecture that we attended did talk about the illegality of those those drugs and how that was a vulnerable point for the people who were engaging in something that they could be arrested for. So I think because of that, um, psychedelics um, were frowned upon. I think weed was probably tolerated as long as it was kept quiet, even mm -hmm. though I think there was a public stance of no, of no, um, you know, sort of being sober when you're doing political work. Now, the reality is, is that, of course, um, this was the reality of the time, and especially in the 70s with the research that we have now on how the federal government um, utilized um, the CIA and others to bring drugs into poor communities. So definitely, I think drug addiction was something that Panther leaders, members probably even, I mean, that was the 70s uh, milieu. I mean, that was just the reality of the times. And I think that it was perceived as something that was... Um, almost like a health issue that was to be struggled against, nothing to be valorized. And I feel like that's a different approach than what I see happening here. How can we tell what's real in what story? <laughs> right, I mean. You got any insights, Professor? <laughs> we, we don't know, and, yeah. LSD, and LSD tells us that too. Yeah. That, that uh, it, it's all a kind of mirage that we're, we're sorting our way through. So if it's a mirage, can't we make it into what we want it to be? Well. At least it seems possible, doesn't it? In a way that the sort of social conditioning tells us, like, it is what it is. Like that horrible saying, right? it is what it is. Life isn't fair. Yeah, no. and, and LSD says, like, yes and no. <laughs> so the drug does speak to us. We think it's a very important aspect of telling a complete story about summer love and the culture, counterculture, and the resonating, lasting impact of it right. to bring in the, the black element. It's right. important. Agreed. <laughs> Do you want to just speak firstly just to that? 
why is it important? How is it significant in the conversation? I think it's really important because you can't really have a conversation about what was happening in the larger uh, society at this time without really talking about the Black Power Movement, the Black Panther Party in particular in this area. I mean, I like to think of San Francisco being directly connected to Oakland, which is directly connected to Berkeley, and looking at how those three areas evolved politically together. So the Panthers were definitely influenced by their connections to uh, the students at Berkeley, at the University of California at Berkeley. They sold red books there. They also came over to San Francisco quite often. They participated in the um, movement at San Francisco State for Black Studies. So there was a, there were a lot of connections there. The Panthers newspaper office was in the Fillmore, um, where they distributed the newspaper. They had a chapter in San Francisco. So there were there were a lot of connections. I mean, the Bay Bridge did not keep people from from coming over. Yeah. Yeah. We've talked about getting back to nature, living out of the concrete jungle, uh, being closer to where your food comes from, and participating with the food production. How about the social aspect? How, how close was it to, to the utopia that we all hear about socially? Um, there were some aspects of it that were really comfortable for me. One was that you could either live alone in your own house and not see anybody ever if you, that was your choice. Mm -hmm. You could also just go for a little walk and you would run into friendly people. Um, eventually, after being there a while, you would know some of the people. You could walk over and visit them, or they would drop in and visit you. And then every Sunday, there was a potluck. So people would come to the potluck. After the meal, those of us that played instruments would get out our instruments and we'd jam together. And if it was winter time, uh, we would have a sweat lodge. And the sweat lodge was a, another kind of bonding because even though it was cold, we'd all take our clothes off and get in there and um, it was, for me, a transcendent experience. So I loved that. And then we had some other kinds of things. We had a flatbed truck and we had a, a school bus for a while. And so we could, for example, all get into the school bus and go to Skaggs Hot Springs and, and take hot baths together there. Or we could all go together to the food co-op and get food in bulk and bring it back. So what we were doing was we were making it so that it wasn't necessary to own a car. I didn't have one. Um, it wasn't really necessary to have a lot of things. What we had was a lot of parties. <laughs> yeah, and the shared resources, of course. You know, right. The vehicle that people could use but not necessarily own. Right, yeah. right. And also, because this was a place where people could come without having to apply, without having to go through a filter, it was land access to which was not denied no one. So there was a wide variety of people there it was the largest number of people from the East Coast social register I'd ever met in one place. But there were also people that came from slums. There were homeless people. There were people of many ethnicities there. Um, there was some complaint at this uh, conference that the hippie communes were primarily white. Ours was not. Yeah, we had a significant proportion of the community that was people of color and I think that we all got along really well. Was Jimi Hendrix the only black participant in the whole scene? No, not at all, not at all. I mean, I think rather than sort of try to identify specific participants, I like to think about just the cultural shift and the connections that were there uh, between black communities and communities that were participating in the Summer of Love. So outside of Jimi Hendrix and his certainly great uh, musical influence, there were a lot of different ways in which the Panthers were connected to the growing movement here. I mean, I have learned about them myself just from attending the conference. So for example, I learned that the Panthers' first newspaper was produced by um, a collective that came out of the Diggers. Um, I learned that the Panthers had a lot of uh, educational connections with the free clinic movement that was part of the Summer of Love, and they definitely connected that with the free <coughs> clinic work they did in Berkeley as well. Uh, so there's really a lot of connections I think that people don't think about. It's not just individual sort of border crossing, yeah. but also something bigger. 
That's great. It's it's the culturals crossing, yeah, ming, intermingling. You can't even like sort out where the, you know, sort of spotlight things. You just kind of have to assume that the, these things were in synergy together. Yeah, it's wonderful. Or integrated, yeah. that word too, integration yeah. in some way. Speaking of the spirit of the time and looking at some of the, the connections and the history and the through line, the anti-war protest movement, the Vietnam protests, et cetera, seems like it was just that next step after the civil rights protests. And so do you think that that did have an influence and a, and a resonance? And did that cause the counterculture movement to even more embrace the black community? Because, hey, we just fought for you to get rights, and now we're all fighting together against this war. They're taking black guys and white guys all over to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Definitely, the anti-war movement is actually, I think, one of the ways in which scholars and activists have really focused on the most political elements of the counterculture, the fact that people were against uh, the war. Now, there was a difference between an ideal of a peace movement and the more radicals who were anti-imperialists, who had this larger critique of U.S. foreign policy, who were critical about what was going on in the African continent, in Latin America, and in the Caribbean with Grenada, and, and all of those things. So I think there was definitely kind of a political shift there, but the exciting part, I think, is how those uh, elements of the counterculture and elements of black radicals came together under this umbrella of anti-war movement. And we have to include Latinos, Chicanos, um, Asian Americans as well. I mean, it was a multicultural milieu. There's a great book about the um, the work of Mexican Americans in Los Angeles uh, working against the Vietnam War. So I think it's an untold story about how black people participated in the Vietnam War when you say anti-war activism, people tend to see a white person's face there. But there was so much going on, like the Panthers, they had rallies, they um, created a lot of, of articles in their newspapers, they were even selling propaganda to encourage people against the war. A lot of soldiers wrote into them. They carried articles about fragging and, and things like that. So they were really part of that underground press. They weren't truly a GI alternative press. Um, in a traditional sense, but they carried a lot of news from soldiers. Mm. Well, we're mainly looking at examining the counterculture of the 60s, the summer of love, et cetera, and looking for the resonating impact, looking for the wisdom that they were trying to espouse there that maybe we should be looking at now because our current political culture, warmongering and capitalism to the hilt and greed running everything. So we, we, I think we still need a little bit what's of rebellion. To, what's to be done? What's to be done? Yeah. And what's to be done usually, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm 79, soon to be 80, born on November 12, 1937. So you're right, I, uh, I first got here in 1957, and soon right up here in North Beach, I think you walked, and that's not far where I, this isn't far where I started out, North Beach, because that's where we were, what Hate Street was to that summer, that summer of love, North Beach, was to the beats. Right in the 50s beforehand, early 60s. I'm talking about 1957 right. is when I came in. Okay. And of course, right. and uh, soon I, uh, we were a much smaller group of people. A lot of people were highly educated, coming from graduate school. Other people like Kerouac and Cassidy uh, were from their own. Kerouac and Cassidy back then, I, I used to see them every weekend because they'd come up, uh, they were working on the railway. And they'd come up, we'd be at the place it was called. I'd love to take people on a little tour of the place it was called, that'd be, it was started with a few people, but soon packed to the rafters, because that was indeed the place, mm -hmm. where the beats, uh, it wasn't like huge, it wasn't like the uh, hate speech where they had to close down the streets. So many people showed up. Mm -hmm. I was there before that. So many people showed up because, uh, and they showed up after, I don't know if it because of, let me recall that, but it was after that song came out. Come to San Francisco, wear some flowers, flowers in your hair, you know, uh, you'll meet some friendly people there. Yeah. And we thought that well, by that time, it was, uh, it was uh, something was going on. You could see it on Hate Street. Something was going on, it was going on. Uh, uh, it was going on, it seems, uh, rent was really cheap. You got a whole flat for $100 a month. Mm -hmm. In fact, there was a lot of empty buildings. And I came from uh, a lot of empty uh, flats, apartments. There were flats with a number of rooms. Uh, and there in my mind. And I came, I hitchhiked in with, uh, with my mother's, uh, with the mother of my children. My oldest son is 51, and she was a black woman. So we were, uh, we were uh, uh, certainly one of the first biracial couples to hitchhike across the country from New York City, Greenwich Village to San Francisco. A lot of people say that the hippies failed. 
Now, given your research, would you say that is true? Or if not, in what ways did they succeed that we can put our finger on today? Yeah. One thing we can do is reevaluate failure. Okay, and success, and what, yes, what as defines Bob, them. As Bob Dylan's saying, yeah. right? Success, uh, success is failure, and, well, oh, I'm blowing the lyric. Um, uh, the, it's true that in some respects the hippies failed, um, in the sense that they had a utopian vision for starting small around themselves and trying to actually change the world. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty ambitious vision. And the failure is often as important to study as the successes. And also the categories by which we determine failure and success, we might question. So, I mean, I think of a group like the Diggers in San Francisco, who are really important um, shapers of what the Summer of Love became in a place like the Haight-Ashbury. You know, the Diggers had all these really interesting ideas, not just about culture, but they had ideas about what I would call political economy. Their whole notion of having a free store, of uh, trying to uh, act your way towards a new reality by borrowing from the theater to sh reshape your own life and your own self. These were efforts not just to, you know, they weren't just, I mean, they, they failed in the sense that we don't do all the things that they wanted us to do now, but they were successes in the sense that they really let us rethink something like, um, what is value? And they let us ask new questions. What is value? What is um, what are really hum humane relationships between people? What forces are dehumanizing in the world? Um, so a lot of their activities became um, maybe failures in the short term, but I think they're still playing out as questions that reverberate down to the present. So sort of paraphrase it, they weren't necessarily successful in achieving this broad scale global utopia, but they definitely succeeded in implanting the questions that we're still asking okay. today. The hippies didn't fail. No. They, they, then where do we see their successes today? What were their successes and how are they still influencing our culture? Right, I mean, I'm a historian, so when I teach this stuff, whether it's in France or anywhere else, I talk about all of these uh, kind of protest movements and cultures being part of a very long tradition of American dissent so and resistance, right? And so that's, that's a significant part of it, is that it's maintaining this kind of extremely important tradition and culture of dissent in a democratic republic that could not thrive, could not be healthy without it. Right. And so the important thing about the counterculture and, and the hippies more broadly, the new left more broadly, is that that generation was enormous. And so the influence of that generation as a as uh, participants in a rebel culture is kind of disproportionate. Right. And continues to carry on today. It's the reason we're here, you know, at a conference 50 years later talking about it is because it's an enduring uh, tradition and it was carried on for a long time and it's still carried on by these people right lots of these people you know may have been hippies then and they may be hippies now but most of them aren't but they're still participating in things that are politically engaged right still fighting the good fight the whole idea that people like abandoned it and went to their hot tubs wrapped in peacock feathers is a kind of caricature right that may be a very tiny proportion of hippies did, but the rest of them carried on doing good work. Well, well, let's talk about some of the successes then. I mean, we want to instill in people a recognition that some of the attributes of that culture are still very much with us today. And what, what would you tell people to convince them that the phenomenon has a lasting impact that we're feeling today? I think the tricky thing about the Summer of Love is that it didn't work on the usual registers by which we talk about how change, recovery, continuity happen in history. So it's not like an election where someone got, you know, the political power changes. This is a kind of force that moves maybe person to person, or it moves through, um, it kind of sneaks its way through on something like rock music within the system, you know, basically something you could buy and sell and make you know, part of the profit system, but then it's also got these other kind of information and messages in it. Right, cultural influence. Cultural yeah. influence, 
kind of whispers below the <laughs> whispers all kinds of things and even the US military I mean we you know most of the counterculture was um, explicitly against the Vietnam War or generally anti-war and a part of the peace movement writ large and yet it's the US military that ironically carries the message over to Vietnam as much as any anyone else does so mm -hmm. so I think that one thing as a historian one of the things that the counterculture of the 60s and the summer of love can teach us 50 years later is that we might widen our lens on how change happens and the vehicles for that change and maybe not get bogged down in the immediacy of the micro is this working right now but just do it because over time you might see more effects than you expected and also to keep trying to think hard about how it all fits together right how does the culture fit with the politics how do things go in one direction or another as they move from one part of society to another? I mean, we just have this amazing um, uh, uh, um, set of stories from the 1960s that can help us try to make sense of what's going on now um, and what happens in the future. Mm. It brought us all here today, yes. literally this melting pot of people who recognize that there's some value to be examined from that whole period. Definitely, and I think, I mean, that's what drew me to this conference is that I, I you know, I, I'm always intrigued by the vision, just the ability to kind of imagine something different because I think oftentimes we're not even able to see or think beyond the ceilings that are put on our head of what we think is possible under capitalism, under imperialism, under the American way. Um, we're supposed to want the American dream, but what about alternatives? And I'm always attracted to uh, movements that are trying to have a utopian vision in a way, who are willing to dream, even if the dreams are flawed, um, even if they're problematic. Um, I'm interested in that because I feel like that's what my Black Panthers and Black Power activists were also trying to do. I want to take advantage of the fact that you are living in Europe, now you're in France, and get that global perspective, that European perspective. You teach about American civilization, about these concepts. What's the reaction of the European students over there? To, like, current events? No, no, no to, to, to what we're talking, to the oh, 60s, yeah. to the counterculture. Well, it's varied, you know? Sure. And, I mean, part of it is that students now, for students now, the summer of love, Right, talking about the 1960s is ancient history. It's like, yeah, there's like very, their yeah. only relationship to it is through popular culture. Yeah. Right? Is it a cool, fascinating thing or a waste of our time? Why are we looking at that? Yeah. No, it is a cool, fascinating thing. Okay. And they're really interested in it. They're really interested in American popular culture for yeah. one thing, right? They're, that's kind of their starting point, And it's often the main reason that they're interested in taking my classes is because they think they're going to learn more about American popular culture. So you attract that. <laughs> yeah, sure. And then the other thing is that they're really interested in the Vietnam War, right? And that's partly also, I think, because of popular culture, because they've seen it in films and on television and things like that. But it's also because they are bewildered by American foreign policy today. They can't understand why the United States under several administrations has done the things that it's done. And so they have a kind of basic sense that all of this weirdness about American foreign policy began with Vietnam, right? Because they can talk to their parents or grandparents who are more celebratory about the United States because of its role in the Second World War and in liberating Europe and things like that. But then it's like, so how do we get from that, from that United States that liberated Europe to put war criminals on trial to a nation that seems to be run by war criminals, right? Like, how did that happen? And so they're often very interested in the Vietnam War for that reason. Like, they have a pretty accurate sense that that's kind of where it turned. And so does that, you feel, give them a, a kindred connection or a, a deeper appreciation for that counterculture and the resistance? And do they absolutely. sort of agree with that resistance <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah because and and also for their own you know in their own culture um which has its own dark history of colonialism and things like that and colonial wars and has also you know right-wing politicians uh, beating the drums of hate and uh being scared of refugees making people feel scared of refugees and things like that so they they're interested in the tools or the models that are provided by, say, the counterculture or punks or 
you know, more mainstream social movement activism and things like that. Like they're looking for, like most young people that I've encountered in years of university teaching, they're kind of looking for a toolkit, right, that they can draw upon to wage their own protests and build their own cultures of resistance. And so for that, you know, I'd like to think as a historian, history is a good place to go. You did a lot of research for your book. You're an historian and have studied the period as well. What kind of things really surprise you that you didn't expect, given what you thought you knew about the period? <laughs> right. Well, I think the biggest thing for me that I think about now is we, we, tend to, we tend to get, we still have this kind of way that we think about how the counterculture came from outside mainstream America. Like, it was authentic and separate and pure. And what I noticed in my research was just how much the counterculture kind of arose within the mainstream culture. You know, it, rock music was a commercial form of music. Yeah. You know, um, Vietnam was, you know, there may have been rock music there, but this was an imperial war yeah. <laughs> waged by the United States. And yet, to me, what the counterculture was were like these little eddies of questioning, of rethinking, in which people took what they had and sort of tried to turn it in a counter direction. Um, and I think that's, again, something I learned from the time that I was surprised by that is relevant today. You know, it's not about who's the purest and who's the most outside. And it's about, it's pragmatic, not utopian. It's how can we use the things that are in the world around us to turn the world another way? A better way. That that's where I found the value. I guess what you're helping me realize, and what I realize, well, what you're helping me realize now, is that there are so many different things that influence the world that originated here. We're, we've been such a beacon historically for people to come and check this out and find some wisdom here and, and participate in some culture that we're doing that we started that we initiated here that was highly influential and resonated around the globe, perhaps. One thing you can you, you you can take away from this period and and sort of the major movements and events and figures is after the Second World War. I mean, San Francisco was always a little bit of a distant outpost, and and the the sort of artistic achievements that you see in painting, photography, sculpture, uh, theater, music, especially psychedelic posters. Um, almost always comes from a very small, vibrant, collaborative, do-it-yourself culture. And that's one thing you can say about the San Francisco Renaissance, you can say it about um, the hippies, and it's one of the things that I think are notable is that nobody was waiting around for some sort of official invitation to do something. That instead what you got were people that just did it. You know, sometimes without a lot of patronage, or support, they got their friends together and they started working on something that, that they got energy from. Mm. And I, I, think that's, I think that's an important aspect of, of this region's culture mm -hmm. and that, that needs to be reinforced because uh, you don't get a permission slip to do these things. Mm. You just have to get together with your friends and start doing it. There you go. So if it's one major lesson to take away from the 60s counterculture in San Francisco, D-I-Y. Don't wait for someone else. Make Very it much happen. so, yeah. Uh, the hippies clearly had issues with their government and politics. We clearly today have issues with our government and politics. Is there anything we can learn from the political agenda of the people at that mm. time that we might apply more, more effectively today than they did? Yeah. I'm a historian, so I'm not always great on the what do we do now questions. Yeah. But I, I'd say two things that I think a lot about. The first is that a lot of people in... In, uh, who participated in the Summer of Love actually had a, quite a wide range of political beliefs. Some were came from, well, some were red diaper babies who came from, you know, parents who'd been in the Communist Party and been blacklisted. But others were libertarians and, mm -hmm. and conservative in some ways. And I think one of the really important things about, let's, you know, the politics of, of the Summer of Love was that it was a universalist politics. And it was about trying to um, connect with people across differences. All right, we might have different political beliefs and we're going to argue about them and talk about them, but that doesn't mean we also can't find common ground where we can um, do things together to, you know, that um, 
in terms of community. So there's a kind of communitarian politics that we might try to recover. And, you know, that means that these, in a way, we think of the counterculture and the summer of love as being about, like, violating civility. You know, people were running naked in the streets. But I think there was an awful lot of fellowship and kindness and people trying to actually be quite civil with each other. <laughs> well, and you have diggers with free stores and free food, and, yeah. and then you had just the, the flower children giving away flowers, right. even money on the street. Yeah, and I think it's like one of the things that we might take from the Summer of Love is their combination of gentleness and toughness, right? This is a, this is a scene where people are trying to figure out how do you combine those two? How do you, how do you how do you be gentle with people without being a fool? Yeah, and get getting, walked all over. Getting and, taken yeah. advantage yeah. of. How do you have a strong ego, but in, in the positive sense? But, but how do you also stay open and not turn just kind of cynical and hard-edged about things? And I think there's something about that. It's like th there was a sensibility that they were trying to work through that we might try to um, keep in mind or bring or model or, or try to experiment with given just how divisive everything is now culturally between people uh, in America and in the world. So that's one thing that I think, why does, the, why does the summer of love matter in our winter of discontent now? <laughs> is um, there's a sensibility, there's a way to think about being a citizen, there's a way to think about being a person that combines gentleness and um, toughness in a way that we might really try to harness and bring bring out more. And and I think the second thing about um, about the summer of love that matters now is um, is that uh, is that politics needs a culture, right? That that you know there's if you're a person let's say of what we now think of as the left or liberals and you 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 want the um, uh, the world to move in better directions in terms of climate change, in terms of rights for um, being widely um, received among different people, if you want the world to have more social justice, um, uh, more access to um, uh, a sense of abundance and possibility in the world, if you long for these things now, um, you know, you can go to the barricades, and there may be times when we need now to go to the barricades and march and and, and be um, aggressively political and vote and, you know, the whole range of political activity. But that needs to sit in a cultural life. Um, and, and, and it needs a, a place where we can go to recharge ourselves, to, to feel whole, to find fellowship and community, and to um, welcome others to it. And I think um, it's that cultural project that, that, the, that some aspects of the Summer of Love was about. Not just... So this is a little different. It's not just that if you change your mind and change consciousness, the world will change. I don't know, maybe. But I think more so that we need to be active political citizens, but we also need to have a culture that we can sit that political activism in where we feel like life has a richness and a sense of worth to it. And, and I think the Summer of Love got really interested in that. How do you build a community? How do you build a neighborhood? How do you make a commune? Uh, what works? What doesn't? Um, what comes up in those, ish in those places around gender equality and who gets to go and who doesn't? And how do we try to tackle these issues? So again, it's like, okay, a lot of the communes failed. A lot of the neighborhoods had trouble. They hit, met up against all kinds of problems. But that the spirit of trying to build a robust, humane culture um, in which we practice politics. I think that's a real lesson that the Summer of Love can um, carry down to our struggles now in the contemporary moment. You're saying the counterculture presented that new challenge. Absolutely, right. in every way. Non-defined roles non and hierarchy and structure. Look at this, yeah. look at this. Gay, transgender, right, it's no longer you know, LB, LGBTQ, you know, it's now like there's 30 letters, right? You know, and we want to respect and embrace it and acknowledge it and validate everyone, of course, but it gets a little tricky, cumbersome. Yes, cumbersome. Another way of putting cumbersome is to say challenging. 
Namely, we're going to learn how to live together in ways that nobody has ever learned to live together before. What a cause. Isn't that great? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's what life is about. Yeah. Negotiating our lives every day. Yes. That's what freedom is. And it's always evolving and changing, so it's adaptation and adjustment anyway. That's right. But Realizing. that's freedom. That's yes. real freedom, yeah. which America promised and never gave. It's real freedom because every day we decide who we're going to be and how we're going to do it. It's kind of be it's kind of a beautiful thing. It's what great great art comes out of. I mean, sitting before a page and deciding what to write or a music score or sitting with an instrument. I mean, we all become creative and creators of the kinds of lives we want to live. So that's the counterculture. Mm -hmm. How do we use what we're now learning and exposed to from the counterculture to help us find a way forward through some of the challenges that we face in society? I, I think the counterculture is in some essence a really hopeful period in the United States. Mm -hmm. In so much as, if you look at the social conditions of, let's say, 1968, it was a hard world. Injustice, racism, we could go on and on, right? The war in Vietnam, tearing literally people's limbs apart. So it's not like those were the days and everything was sweet. But people challenged those unpleasantnesses, those dangers, those horrors. And, and I think, again, the counterculture is a reminder. You don't have to accept the terms of your existence as they were handed down to you. So I think that's, that's the enduring lesson of that period of time.